tempted to think Fabidi is the oldest based on hair color. That is not the case. Uh, but we do want to talk about your guys' younger years in ministry. Um, so because this is a first five-year conference and there's a lot of brothers in here that are young in their ministries, uh, one question I wanted to ask you guys as you reflect back on your younger years in ministries, what, what are things that you wish you knew that you now know now? Can y'all tell us how old you are first, just so everybody has some context of how far into the deep future y'all are from where they are right now? Well, be before I do that, I'm just remembering the first time I met Tabidi. I was a college student. He'd been pastoring a local church for about 10 years, <laughs> and uh, it was just great to hear him. It was such an inspiration for me. I'm just always trying to pattern myself after that, Tabidi. And <laughs> yeah, the longer this thing go on, the older I get, right? <laughs> But here's the question. <laughs> so, if you, if you, how, how, question there. Is the question, Dodge? How old are y'all? Real quick, before you answer his substantive question. I'm 47. I'm 57. Seriously. <laughs> his hair has been here longer than the rest of his body. So, it's, it's confusing. But this is actually 47. This is really fine. <laughs> that, was, that was good. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is worse than one of those Duncan boots, man. I, you know, this is, he's just whipping on us, I've man. been waiting to do this for a very long I can time. Tell. Uh, uh, no, so seriously, um, in, in your younger years of pastoral ministry, what are the things that you, you were not as aware of that now you are more aware of in pastoral ministry uh, that you like to commend to us younger men in ministry? Uh, but it would be a lot of things, brother. I'm trying to zero in on things that would be helpful uh, and not just personal. Uh, I think I'm more aware now of my limits, the kind of um, romantic optimism, the kind of unbridled uh, ambition for fixing everything has been duly chastened. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm less, far less, the perfectionist. Uh, and I think far more, um, accepting of not only my limitations, but therefore other people's limitations, right? I, and so I did, the other way of saying this is I didn't know how self-righteous I was you know, in many respects and how that was driving a sense of what people should be and what ministry should be. Um, and, and, and so that, that's one thing I didn't know. This is, brother, you're far more limited than you think. Um, and yet God's far more greater than I thought, too. And, and so learning something more about how the Lord does things despite me, you know, and does things I wasn't even thinking about. And then when he lets me see a little bit of it, oh, yeah, that really needs to be done, you know. Um, and so uh, I'm learning more to, to trust the Lord, his providence, his mysterious ways, his, his kindness. Um, I, I didn't know early in ministry. I, I did not know that that um, I did not know how much growing as a preacher I needed to do. I, I was far too confident in my ability to preach, um, and so you know that, that that's there's been some chastening around that too, and some the Lord sanctifying around those kinds of things as well. Um, when I first went into ministry, I, I didn't have as strong an ecclesiology, right? I kind of loved the church, um, thought the church was important, but like a lot of people, I didn't have a sense of, I, I, I'm, I'm almost convinced that until you've been in a healthy church and you kind of feel it and move in it, you just kind of don't know you're sick, right? Uh, and I'm, I'm just like a lot of Christians who, who love their church and wanted good things for their church, but didn't know that it was unhealthy. You know, that there were things growing inside of it that were maladies, right? And, um, were weaknesses that the Lord by his grace needed to address by his word. Um, and so it wasn't coming to, it wasn't until I came to Capitol Hill and um, began to sit and learn and be poured into and that I began to see a, a different vision of church um, and began to see that, yeah, those were lovely saints. I still love them. I'd still commend that church to people, but began to see, oh, this is how some things could be different and it really be a blessing to God's people uh, and to the honor of Christ's name. So uh, those, those would be something. Can, can you turn those things maybe into 
like action steps for young ministers to maybe work against that? So when you talk about not being as aware of self-righteousness um, or in preaching, any action steps you would give? I'm a little bit hesitant to, um, because I think one of the one of the diseases of you is is this kind of love for action steps and this kind of all of life's a project, right? And and if I I was asking for a friend. No, I was yeah. saying, <laughs> I was saying, I was saying. Bobby Jameson is younger than me. <laughs> um, I think it's a fine question, and and I'm going to evade it a little bit and 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 say. The ministry is sanctified, at least it ought to be, and the Lord will teach you things that you didn't know you needed to be taught, and he will teach you things according to his own program and timing. Um, so I think in, in my own youthful zeal, I think there, I can look back and see things where I thought, oh, here's a five-step thing for me to address this really good thing, right? And it just didn't work. It just fell out in ashes. And then the Lord did some other stuff that felt like to me distractions. And then when it came to pass, it was like, oh, he took care of that other thing and some stuff, other stuff in, in a really much more effective way in hindsight. Um, so, that, so there's a part of me that wants to encourage just a, a relaxing in the Lord. Not a complacency, not an indifference, but a trust, a, a resolve to lean into Christ and to enjoy him and to know that he's began a good work, he's going to complete it on his timetable, in his way, and that's going to be better. Okay? Um, now, if there's some folks after 9 o'clock who, who really want five things, I, I could say a couple things. But I think I, I want to encourage on the onset of ministry for young people, younger guys, a kind of relax. It's going to be all right. You know, um, it doesn't all have to be fixed right now, if at all, some of it. And um, you probably don't know how to fix it. Your idea probably isn't as good as you think it is. And even if the idea is good, your ability to execute it may not be as great as you think it is. So, you know, relax, be patient. You know, pray a lot. Pray a lot. Um, and be faithful to the ministry of God's word, as these brothers were exhorting us. And, and really do let the word do the work. Let that be more than a slogan. Let that really be your ministry philosophy. Um, and um, trust that the Lord will be doing things in your life and the people's life as, as you rest in him. Mark, Mark Dever. <laughs> Brian Davis. Hello, Brian. Yeah. Mark, yes, you had Mark. younger years. Um, well, I've had so many of them, Brian. Would you, <laughs> would you like the 90s, my early years at CHBC, or the 80s, my church planting in New England, or the 70s, when I was first preaching as a teenage evangelist? Whichever ones you think will be helpful. You, you just, just pick. Uh, give me the 80s. I was born in that time. Yeah. Uh, I think in the 80s, I had come out of Duke University. I was at Gordon-Conwell. It was egalitarian. My professor I worked with, Roger Nicole, was a strong biblical feminist. That's the way he called himself. Loved him dearly. Uh, reformed soteriology, Baptistic ecclesiology. And it was studying with him that convinced me to be a complementarian. I'm like, okay. He doesn't sound like the rest of Christian history. The way they've read the Bible. All right. I love him dearly. I think he might be wrong on this. Um, and then as I worked on it more, I still was not confident enough in my position when we started a church in 1985 to try to make complementarianism clear in the founding documents of the church. And so I left that church the little gift of about a decade of fighting over uh, men's and women's roles because I was not clearer in the inception of that church. And I realize now that was a foolish mistake on my part that may have actually, I was just there for a year and a half, but it died about eight or nine years after I left. And I, I wonder, I think that was one of the fatal blows that, of the church. It was, it was, I think, largely my mistake. Can we get the 70s? Please, the 70s, because I want to know how you dressed as a teenage evangelist. <laughs> uh, there were some silk shirts uh, that had longer collars. 
the those, hair those was mistakes. the hair was sometimes parted in the middle, and looked a little on the long side. Um, what was your head size like back then? <laughs> I, I think it was identical. Yeah, I got it. Other sizes may have been smaller, but I, I think I think the head side size was identical. Uh, uh, you know, I, I would preach any place. I preached in the Assembly of God Church. I preached in the Church of the Nazarene. I preached in a Pentecostal church. I preached in Baptist church. I preached at First Methodist. I would just preach in anything. Preached out in the city park in Madisonville. Um, I just looked back with great thankfulness to God, preaching in country churches that were very dear. I, w- I was brought up in a county seat First Baptist church with Bach on the pipe organ, and but I would be out in the country churches preaching, and they would talk as much as I would talk, you know. So I was very used to a very different style of service as well, but loved it. Um, so the Lord was very kind to give me hugely broad experience before I ever even went to college, just as a very young Christian. So I'm just thankful. I don't know. I, I'm lessons. Uh, I don't think my soteriology was that clear. I mean, I knew Jesus died to save us, but that's about that's about it. How about the 90s? Well, the 90s are when I come to Capitol Hill. Um, I, my theology hasn't changed since then. I think I would echo a lot of what Thabiti was saying. I think older members who at the time, I don't think I thought were a problem, but I didn't understand their value. Even if I knew I was to, that they were valuable. I was that clued up. I don't think I knew it. I didn't feel it like I feel it now. I think when you've been in a church for a while and you've seen people that you invest in and you love leave unexpectedly, then you realize how extraordinary it is that those Joneses have actually been sitting over there for 43 years. They have been there with preachers they didn't like. They have kept praying. They have kept, you know, bringing stuff to potluck. You know, they, they have, have supported the youth group back when they, before they had teenagers and after they had teenagers. I mean, it's just, I think the older I get, the more I appreciate the deaf, the, the couple that's sitting there that are effectively deaf. But they've kept smiling for 10 years after they couldn't hear anything. Maybe that's why they are smiling. Um, you know, that they're still there, supportive at the church. There's just, there's a whole different set of virtues that begin to become more existentially obvious as I myself approach physical decrepitude. Context clues lets me know what that means. Um, t- tell, tell me about the... It's, it's, it's not a dope state physically. That's what I'm talking about, man. You know what it is. We understand each other. Um, that was a very academic use of the word dope. <laughs> <laughs> a dope state, physically. Uh, t- tell me about, in, in those younger years of ministry, how, did, did you guys have older men that were very influential for you to keep going in ministry and to encourage you in ministry? I, I would say I, from the start of what I began to discern as a call to ministry, it was older saints who were kind of speaking that in my life. I mean, it, it, was, it was strange. We were part of a church plant in North Carolina. Uh, I was happy to, from time to time, fill, fill a pulpit or uh, take over a Wednesday night Bible study if the pastor needed a break and we were leading small groups in our home. Um, and and it, was, it felt odd to me at the time, but I began to get sort of invitations at churches, like in my hometown and other places, to come speak at various events, like Youth Day or African American History Month or some of that sort, and it was always the senior saints that came up to me afterwards and, and would begin to probe and say, now, what, what are you doing with your life? And I, so I worked for this, da, 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 and where are you in your calling? I, I didn't even understand the language, really. I, I, I don't know. I, somebody said earlier, I ain't what I used to be. I ain't what I'm going to be. I don't know. And, and it was like, no, baby, I, I think you might have a gift there. I, I think you might be called to preach. And uh, for a long time, you know, I was like, oh, you know, thanks, but you know, you're kind of old, you know. <laughs> um, so they were old heads to you. That's right. right. Okay. Um, and and yet they, they would they would they would be very kind. They they would take my dismissals and and follow it with encouragement. Um, and after a while, through the sort of repeated kind of comment like that, I actually began to think about it. 
Um, and, and I noticed that I, did, I had this desire to teach God's word. And I had this desire to shepherd people in God's word. Um, and then the Lord started really increasing my love for the local church uh, and helping me to see that some of the things that I really cared about in terms of the well-being of Christians and the things that I was hoping they wouldn't get in into via sort of bad television programming and things of that sort, I, the Lord at, some, at a certain point convinced me that the way to do that was for me was not to continue in the secular employment that I was in um, and, and, and do the other things that sort of on the side, but that if I really wanted people to be protected from those things, I should shepherd them. Um, and when that sort of flipped over in my heart, uh, that sense of calling and desire um, grew, grew ever strong. And, and, and there really hasn't been a season where there hasn't been older saints, whether it's just a decade or whether it was three decades, who haven't played some kind of encouraging role um, in, in my life in ministry. I think, brother, just to, a bit of a student of your life, just to go back a little earlier, the pastor at Files Chapel, when you were a teenager, though you were not yourself regenerate at that time, mm -hmm. I think the Lord used that faithful brother's example and ministry in your life to probably imprint a pattern in you that he would later call you to, to step into. I think that's right. Uh, Reverend F.D. Betts, is, he's gone on to his reward, but he pastored uh, my mom's church for 55 years, I think. And um, he was kind of an old school, small town pastor who not only sort of led the congregation in, in its gathered worship, but had an active ministry of house to house, checking on folks, caring for folks. Uh, I got arrested after my sophomore year in high school, uh, North Carolina on a class H felony. And uh, my life was about to be changed real radically. And um, I remember when I had my court date, uh, sitting in there kind of hearing all this legalese, not knowing what was going on, but knowing for a long time by then that I was in significant trouble. Uh, he came into the courtroom. And as soon as he came into the courtroom, the, the judge acknowledged him and called him to the bench. And he went up to the bench, and he kind of he had these graying eyes at the time, sort of gray, blue eyes at the time, older man. Looked at my mom and, and smiled and looked at me. And I went up to the bench, and they talked for just a minute or two in, in tones I couldn't hear. And he walked by and, he, and he smiled again with those gray eyes, and he walked on out of the courtroom. And the judge dismissed the case and uh, on, his on his test, on, on his testimony, in his vouching. Um, and so that idea of being more than a preacher, not less than a preacher, but more than a preacher, shepherding the people, um, there's no doubt about that. We would be playing as little kids around the neighborhood, riding our bikes, and he, was all, he would always pull up on us. And he said, you know, what y'all doing? Talk real slow. He's from Arkansas. What y'all doing? And, and we would answer. He says, I'm going to get y'all a job. I'm going to see that man and get y'all a job. What kind of job you want? We talk about all kind of crazy stuff. He said, no, I'm going to get you a job on the garbage truck. That's what you need to do, be on the garbage truck. <laughs> and we'd all be like, hey, we're going to know garbage truck. And he would say two things. He would say, uh, that's honest work. Ain't nothing wrong with that, boy. And then he would say, and you can do more than that if you want to. And just would encourage us in our studies and things of that sort. And so, yeah, I, I, I owe more than I know. Thanks for sharing that, man. Mark, did you have any older men mentoring? You? Yeah, I think so. Uh, if you look at the little book, What is a Healthy Church? Uh, some of you have seen that. If you've ever noticed, there's a dedication in it to three guys. Uh, Harold Purdy, Wallace Thomas, and Ed Henniger. Uh, Harold Purdy was the pastor of the Baptist church that I grew up in. Uh, Wally Thomas was the pastor of the Methodist church in town, who after I was converted became a very close friend. And Ed Henner was pastor of the Presbyterian Church that I went to when I was in college. And so I love the fact that that little book is dedicated to a Baptist, a Methodist, and a Presbyterian pastor, all three of whom I think were just examples of godliness. Uh, is there anything that you think uh, young men should do if they don't have, or they feel like they don't have access to maybe older men, or they don't have access to maybe older saints that are as proactive in their life? Um, you wish for encouragement for them? I think for those three that I mentioned, I actually took the initiative with all three of those. 
So I wouldn't say any of those took initiative particularly toward me. They were receptive. But so I would just say, friend, you can establish relationships with people that are five times your age. You might be surprised how much they'd like to talk to you. Uh, but you just take the initiative. Go see them. Well, I was going to ask, I've heard both, both of you talk really helpfully about patience uh, in ministry. Uh, Mark, I think about times you've talked about when you first got to CHBC um, and you uh, tried to be really patient with change and stuff. I've heard you talk about the same stuff. I heard you talk about some ways you wish you were more patient in Grand Cayman, too. Um, and there's plenty of stuff that I've heard older pastors say uh, about how to do things that I'm like, like the beat he's talking about. Kind of you feel like, nah, I got five steps. We can do that quicker than that. And then there's been some stuff within like the past three or four years that I'm like, oh, that makes a lot more sense. Or ah, I don't see that much of the long game yet, but that's making a lot more sense. What are some ways that we can try to be more patient? Uh, some examples of how you've seen that bear fruit in y'all's ministry. Uh, just help us to think about how to be patient, even for things we can't see how the patient way will work yet. I want to begin by thanking God for the impatience of young people. I mean, there is much good in brothers who don't understand why they should not take, why they should take no for an answer. There's much good in that. So if everybody was as patient as 80-year-olds, that would not be good for the church. So let's harness that energy, that action, that idealism. Yes, but if we could just ally it with uh, some more uh, wisdom, kind of like honestly what what uh, you guys were giving me at dinner when I was talking about tweeting about something, you were telling me, why don't you not do that? I mean, that was the reverse role. I was the young guy, you were the old guy. But I mean, you know, I think that's often what you get from an older brother, you get that perspective. I've often said that I think young guys have great acuity and poor depth perception, and old guys have maybe have lost some acuity, but they have very good depth perception. You know, so young guys see what's right and wrong, and they're often right, they have no idea how to get from here to there. And that's where the older guys can be helpful and like, I'm not sure which way, but I think I, I can tell you how to get there. You know, So if you're trying to get over there, you gotta talk to that person and that person and do this for three years and then it'll happen. You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's a useful coalescence when those kind of things can come together. And then, then the, the state becomes truly dope. My joy is Getting complete, yeah. <laughs> I think it's a great question, and I, I, I think it's a great answer. Um, I, I think part of what I want to say is in, in exhorting people to patience, I think sometimes young people think you're saying, do nothing. So doing nothing is not the same thing as being patient. Uh, some of the hardest work you will do and some of the most faith kind of uh, requiring work you will do is wait, right? Um, and so this, this idea of allying with um, the, the sort of older or uh, longer tenured people in the congregation to kind of sort of inform your sense of when should I act and what kinds of act, how do I get from here to there, uh, I think that's just spot on. I mean, your, your congregation is likely to have, to use a name many of you, some of you will remember, it's likely to have some Walter Cronkites in it. Right? It's going to have people whose opinions really just sort of carry weight. Cronkite was this news anchorman whose, whose word was just kind of trusted in the generation before kind of tabloid journalism and all of that good stuff. And so if you lose the Cronkites, you're probably going to lose the church. But if you're patient enough and discerning enough to sort of figure out who are those older persons that everybody kind of looks to and their words seem to carry a lot of weight, not that they talk a lot, but just when they do talk, Everybody seems to listen. Um, and if you will seek those folks out and, and talk with them about what you're thinking and the things you hope to, to have happen, here's the other thing about age. You live long enough, you, you become a historian, right? Uh, and those Cronkites can kind of tell you where the bodies are buried, you know, which, which battles were fought when and, and what strategies were used and, and help you think through why you don't want to do that or why you might want to do this. And that will... That will in your eldership and, and in conversation with the members of your church, that, that'll shape out a speed. That'll shape out a direction that I think will be safer, right, in the multitude of counselors. It'll be safer than 
than what I felt, for example, this just kind of pulling, let's go, and, and we can get this done, and I just need to convince everybody with this one great sermon. It's, it's just not the way to do that. It's not the way to do that. Can I encourage people with two things I've seen, like older guys, bless me. One is you, Mark, uh, you know, if somebody was going to say, hey, you're at this church where, you know, yeah, it's struggling, last past the community adultery, it's kind of dying off, older saints, and like, okay, so what are you going to do to turn it around? You're like, I'm going to just show up and preach the Bible every week, and then I'm just disciple people. You're like, okay, well, what are you going to do to turn it around? It might sound like this dude is just, he's late, he don't want to do nothing. But then you look 20 years later, and I can't find anything extraordinary that you did. I mean, really, you just did what Jesus told us to do over and over and over again, and were patient enough not to panic and think, oh, I need to do something else to make sure this happens more quickly. Just um, so I've learned from you a confidence in the means of grace God has given us to obey Jesus and to trust and take him at his word and let him do the work of the ministry. And then um, another thing is talking to older men where something will happen in my life or something near me uh, that seems like the end of the world and I'll panic. And older men and women will be like, you'll be fine. It happened to me about four times and you're fine. And it's helpful because then I am, uh, and I benefit from that a lot. Um, so I want to encourage and affirm um, the kind of seeking out of older saints, uh, if only so that we don't panic when we don't need to and we can trust the Lord and rest in them. Yeah. I, I think one of the ways the Lord teaches us normally to trust in the stated means, the, the ordinary means of grace, is by giving us children. And as your kids get older... Uh, you watch them. I mean, you know, you you saw your, your your son go to school today for the first time. That was cool. Um, you know, your kids are in co going to college now. To one of them and another about to go. And uh, you know, my kids are well now. They're having kids. You know, so we're kind of in different stages. But as as you keep going, you see that the way you affected your children was not by that one sermon you preached. It's not by that one talking to you gave them, or that great gift you gave them. It was the daily, you were there at dinner, and you had that conversation, and they knew you were going to react like this, and you told them this 742 times, and, you know, you just kept going. It's very much like pastoring. You know, it's probably not going to be the, the, the Ephesian series is really going to do it. It's just, you just keep, you know, every Sunday bringing them God's Word, and you know, it may not be a home run, but it's a single, and you get a bunch of those in a row, and guess what happens, you know? And it... it, it what, what happens? <laughs> I don't really know, Thabiti. It was just a sports illustration. What do the Colts that do in that situation? Sounded good. I think they take their pucks, and they <laughs> fling them against the backboard. And then it's cornhole! Um... <laughs> But I, I, I think if you, if you keep doing the sermon, Sunday in, Sunday out, non-extraordinary, but always faithful, always true, just like that's what shapes the character of your kids in God's providence normally, well, that's what shapes the church. And there's, there, there isn't a quick way to do it. You can't just send them all on a conference, you know, or get the new latest book or the DVD series. I mean, th those things are all good. None of them are bad, but it's just, you know, God isn't going to give you an insta-child. You know, like, okay, if you'll pay 2000 more dollars, you can just stick them in the microwave for two minutes, and they'll come out, you know, 23 happy with a wife and kid. Just for clarity, that will kill your kids. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but uh, that, that's, It's the same way with the church. You, you can't find a shortcut to have a healthy church. That's really helpful to hear, though, because, yeah, you, you think, oh, there is a long way to do it, but what if there was this short way? And it's like, no, the only way is the long way. Just keep And they're such the good way. in that long way. Yeah, yeah. Just like all the memories with Amen. your kids. Amen. All the memories with your church. Amen. The Lord knows what he's doing. Amen. Um, two more categories. Hey, Brian. That's, I'm benefiting. We from were having outside. a great time over here. I'm a Gentile over here looking in. Uh, <laughs> Two, two categories, just want to spend some, some prolonged time in. Uh, one is uh, how, to, how to disagree, how to disagree. And then the second is going to be kind of time management stuff. Uh, but disagreement. So both of you are known for disagreeing. One of you are known for true. one of you are known for being nice about it. Um, can, can can you guys give us any can you guys give us any wisdom about how to have 
uh, tender hearts, thick skin, and to think sharply. Um, just about things we disagree in, when to say something, how to do it outside of our church, how to do it in, inside of our church. Yeah. How do you guys think about disagreements? I think you're the one who should talk because you, I think you're more hot-blooded than I am, and I think you're nicer than I am. Hot-blooded? Yeah, I think you tend to get more upset about things than I do. He just acts more upset. But no, you I think he does. But I think you exercise even more self-control. I think that's this is your... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I'm... Don't you think Says right? the guy who had to be counseled not to do stuff on Well, Twitter. that's true, that's true, that's true. <laughs> but that's unusual. I mean, that's not normal. <laughs> okay, so this is my thing, Trip. Um, a few things, man. Um, one is, I think, in a fallen world where truth matters, in a vocation where souls are in the balance, um, we're going to have to choose some fights and be willing to do that. Um, with, with the, the sort of pluralism that we swim in is kind of averse to disagreement. It really wants to say everything and everybody's okay. Don't draw any lines. And that's just going to be utterly confusing for the kind of clarity that we've been all talking about today on the clarity on the gospel, the clarity on conversion, the clarity on sort of biblical vision for the Christian life, discipleship. Right? Uh, so we, 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 are, we are people in a calling who can least afford to be evaders of the fight when the fight needs to be enjoined. Now, that's not to say, you know, First Timothy 3 is real clear, right? We're not brawlers, right? We're not out seeking fights. And, and I do think um, people confuse a contentiousness with, with courage. And so, you know, so for example, I, I, I would write off 98% of, sort of watch bloggers and discernment blogs uh, as largely just contentious and about foolish arguments and, and quarrels over things that are, that are unimportant. But from time to time, uh, brothers, we, we're just going to find ourselves facing issues, uh, whether they are broadly in the culture or more personally in our churches, we're going to find ourselves facing issues where we got to man up, right? Now, your question is how to, how to do that well. I, I don't know, but here's some things that I, I try to think through. Um, one is I do try to think and pray about, um, is this a hill to die on? There are, going back to your earlier question about what's different for me now than in my earlier years, there are fewer hills to die on, but they're clearer to me now. Um, are they different hills? Not altogether. Not, not altogether. Um, so, so one is we just got to think through that priority. I mean, is this something where the Lord in his word tells me to enjoy the fight and, and to sort of lean in as best I can? The other thing I, I think we want to do is we want to go into those conversations, these public disagreements, with an eye on redemption. We want to be as redemptive as possible. So the, so the goal isn't to destroy your enemy, right? So I'm thinking here, 2 Timothy 2, 24, where, where Paul writes to Timothy and says basically to, to answer your opponents gently. Why? God may grant them repentance. Right? And so we want to we go into the conversation and have the conversation in such a way that if the person needs to repent and recognizes the beauty of repentance, it's not harder for them to repent because of how I've been having the conversation. Right? As best we can, we want, we want to do that. We want to be redemptive. And, and then the other thing is I think as best we can, we, we want to honor the people that we're talking with by uh, not dehumanizing uh, and by actually doing justice to their argument or their view, right? Uh, so I think I do, I, maybe this is old fashioned, but I still think it's important. The first thing you do in public debate is try to state the other person's position in a way that they recognize and would endorse it. Otherwise, you're not even having the same conversation. And if possible, even better and more and forcefully that's right. than they've done it. That's exactly right. So then you're not dealing with straw men. Then you're not mischaracterizing people or misrepresenting people. 
uh, and then you can enjoy the discussion with, with what you assume to be your better arguments. Uh, and, that, and then everybody's kind of served by that. And I think the other thing, last thing I, I would say is that we want to keep in mind is um, you also very often trying to win the people who are watching the debate, right? So there's a sense in which if I'm, if I'm engaging somebody who seems to me to be incorrigible or seems to me to have well thought out reasons why they're in the position that they're in, even though I disagree, and I'm probably not going to win them, I, I'm mindful that, that in our day and age, there, there are just tons of eyes on the conversation. And, and if I can, I want to engage that person in a way that wins the other eyes on the conversation. Um, and so that, that's, that's, those are some of the things that I, I try, to be, uh, try to keep in mind. And, and then I guess the last thing is I, I do try to be accountable to what I say publicly. Uh, and, and that means, for example, you, you, you mentioned a, a particular back and forth yeah. earlier today. Uh, I got involved in a back and forth because somebody tagged me in a tweet asked me what I thought about a particular book. And I think I responded uh, in my flesh, quite honestly, and said something like, ah, that kind of craziness, man. Who gives attention to that? And the author said, wrote a blog post and named me and several others who were tagged in that tweet said, you know, come meet me out in the street. Now, where I'm from, brother, call you out. You, you got to go out and meet me. So I thought, okay, that was dumb. It's got me into something I actually really would not rather spend time on. But having said that, I owe an account, right? And so I, I try to, this, this is also why when I, when I was blogging more regularly, uh, I would answer people's questions and comments on my blog. I had said something publicly. Uh, and in terms of my own academic training, you, you put something in print, you say something publicly, it's fair game to criticize it. It's fair game to engage it. Uh, and rather than just sort of post stuff and run, I, I see people on, on, online all the time who throw little firebombs and then you can't find them. You know, they, they run away from the, from the sort of controversy that results. I think that's cowardly, and, and I think it's unedifying. And, and I think we can make ourselves accountable to our public presence to the extent that we have one by simply showing up to answer the questions, the counter charges, and things of that sort. So that's me. Can I ask a follow-up? How do you choose, if you could say real briefly, what, what hills are the ones to die on? If that's an important part of this, how do we it's a quick grid to think, think through. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to die on um, hills that are marked uh, cardinal Christian doctrine and truth. Uh, so the personal work of Jesus Christ, the gospel, um, all the things that sort of grow, grow out of that uh, scripture. Uh, I'm happy to die on hills that are protective of Christian people. So if I think there's someone teaching a kind of error that's going to sway lots of Christian people into that error, um, I don't want to be a bystander to that discussion. I, I want to get in it. Um, I, I, I am um, willing to sort of, even with my own kinsmen according to the flesh, for the sake of my kinsmen according to the flesh, um, dive into issues that I think are detrimental to uh, my folks, uh, if I can use that kind of language, particularly the church, the Christian church. Um, so those, those are, that's sort of the constellation of, of issues there. And if you can comment one thing, I, I remember when I did the internship, um, one thing that I had been discouraged by and still immature, was much more <laughs> immature in how I would disagree uh, with those in authority. Um, and I remember doing an internship and you, you, you seemed to create a very safe and welcomed environment to disagree and to process through things. As you mean dis to disagree with me? Yeah, like it was, and I remember being just very disarmed by that, because I'm like, the dude's way smarter than me, there's a Bible better than me, but you kind of encouraged us to disagree with you, and it, it wasn't like, you didn't, you didn't shut it down, like if, it was, if people were being proud, you'd shut it down, uh, but there was, like, how did that happen, and how important do you think that is in a, in a church environment, uh, to have space for disagreement with, as your training leaders and as leadership? Yeah, I, I'd leave training leaders to the side for a moment. Just in the leadership of the church, I think you've got to have honesty. So I, one of the worst things I think a group of elders can do is to decide they will only act when they're unanimous. They mean it spiritually, but it shuts down honest conversation. Uh, I would decide things by six to four vote. 
That depends on what it is. There might be some things I'd want more consensus on. But on the whole, I'm going to value disagreement uh, on the eldership before. I've had, uh, I've had brothers who you know, vote against me on particular things, and I could tell that they feel bad about it. So I'd go for a walk with them the next day to make sure they understood that I was fine with them voting against me. If they were voting their conscience. That's what they thought. And in fact, my esteem for them even goes up a little bit. You know, so I appreciate they're willing to do that. Uh, I lose votes regularly on the eldership. Uh, I'm fine with that. We're not voting on the divinity of Christ. You know, we're voting on the pastoral wisdom of this course of action or that. And I just have no reason to think that I would always be right. Um, so I, I think that's just very important to have in leadership. And once that's there in leadership, it's naturally then a component of the training. But the most fundamental thing is that you understand your own limitedness yourself and therefore are really happy for the Lord to send other people along who are willing to work with you and they kind of make up for your lack by the things that they see and can do. I've also seen both of you brothers model uh, in relationships it being uh, living in such a way where it's so clear that you love people and you want the best for them, that you can disagree without your relationship being up for grabs every time. So that you love them so well that when you disagree with them or when you push back on something, people are not wondering, oh, I think Mark hates me, I think Thabiti hates me. It's so clear from the way that uh, y'all interact with people that you love me and so I can hear your disagreement in a way that can end up civilly. Like Mark, sometimes you'll say things really sharply and I'll be like, if anybody else said that to me, I would stop being their friend. But Mark has sh shown his love. Amen. It's a, it's a unique <laughs> gift, brother. It's it it is. <laughs> it is. Mark berates people, and they love him for it even more. Uh, but I think it's because it's so clear that you love folks. You have that foundation, the relationship with folks. And I think it just sets a really good example and, uh, yeah, allows people, like you're saying, to have an honest combo. So. I, I think one clear sign of danger someone you do not want to put in leadership is someone who cannot be disagreed with. Uh, there was a, a prominent pastor some years ago who was publishing books and uh, on the Together for the Gospel conference, uh, C.J. Ligon, Al Mohler, and I are supposed to sign off on all the books that go in the bookstore at T4G. And I was the holdup on putting this person's books in. The others were various stages of maybe okay, and I was one to always say no. And, uh, you know, I did that from the anonymity of my study, you know, handing the list to somebody, handed to somebody, handed to somebody, and then that's what ends up in the bookstore. Well, through a sad series of events, this came to the knowledge of the person whose books I was saying no to. And uh, it became the manly, godly thing to do for me to phone this brother directly and explain to him I didn't want him to misunderstand why his books were not being sold there. It was, in fact, not Al Mohler's fault, and it was not C.J. Mahaney's fault, and it was not Ligon Duncan's fault. It was me, and here are my concerns, and that's what I did. And one of the things I told him, the main thing I told him, is uh, I thought he was my brother in the Lord, but I thought he was proud. And I was scared that young men would be attracted by his arrogance, and all that would happen is he would at one, some point explode, and it would harm them. And I said, I, I honestly love you and want to see you prosper, and I don't think you're in a, a stable position. And I don't want to encourage people to, to read your stuff because of that. Well, well what did let me know that? I never lived around this man. Well, it was watching how he did leadership, how he took disagreements. And w when you see somebody who will not brook disagreement, you just quietly just like move away. You know, they just, they may be regenerate, they may not be. You know, they're certainly not somebody you want to trust with any kind of authority over other people. So, I mean, you know, when, whenever you're in authority, you just have to be extremely careful that it's a wonderful gift. Authority is not bad. But authority is so abused in our world uh, that I think we, particularly all of us, are, are elders and pastors. I think we have to be particularly careful at the way we do that. And I mean, when uh, Jason Revent's here, Jason just literally today becomes my personal assistant, so the, the person who handles everything. And um, he and I were taking a walk yesterday, and I was you know, explaining some things about confidentiality. And then I said, but now look, we need to have some kind of escape valve so that if you're seeing something and you feel bound in conscience not to say anything 
about it to anybody because of your job, and yet it's something negative or hard or might reflect poorly on me, we need to figure out a way for you to talk to somebody about that that you know that I'm saying, yeah, that's the right way to do it. And I said, basically, just find an elder that you trust. Talk to them. You know, so we need to build some kind of escape valve for that use of authority that he's going to be recognizing in his job. So I think whatever positions of authority God puts us in, we have to allow for things not to always be right from us, for there to be disagreements, and for us to value honest counselors. What a great gift you have a brother who will work with you, who will disagree with you, but still love you and, and value you and trust you enough to keep working with you. So now part of what, part of what I want to commend in the brother's conversation, that, that moment ago he, he said I was more hot-blooded. And what you're hearing now is he's more cold-blooded, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> brother, brother has ice water in his veins. There's a kind of courage in, in Mark's leadership that I've observed where he'll go right to that brother and say, yo, man, you proud. <laughs> you know, and I ain't gonna sell your stuff because I don't like you, how proud you are, you know. And, and, and it ain't nobody else's fault. I did it. <laughs> I did it. You don't like it, you can be mad at me. <laughs> but, you know, and, and so there's this willingness that I also think is missing in too much Christian leadership of just being kind of heart to heart, face to face, and having hard conversation. Um, and so while, while he might see a, a kind of, you know, really sort of writing more publicly and, 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 and gets kind of animated about those things, what I see in him is this kind of steady courage that, that moves toward people in private ways um, and in profoundly helpful ways, saying the things that need to be said when they need to be said. And I praise God for that. I, I, just a little footnote on that. I called and uninvited somebody to a conference that we're both involved with. It was it me? No. Okay. Uh, uh, just like two two days ago or three days ago, and um, I got him on the phone, and literally the first thing I said is, "Hello, I'd like to uninvite you to this conference." And uh, I stayed on the phone with this brother for about ten minutes, and he persuaded me that I was wrong. So I said, "Yeah, consider yourself invited. Yeah, <laughs> if there's a problem with it, I'll take up your side." You know. Um, yeah, but thank you, God. Oh, I, I just want to take real quickly. Thank you for doing this, brother. But I, I want to take two, two things he just alluded to and just sort of put them on the screen as two good questions to ask guys you're thinking about serving as elders or deacons. Um, when's the last time you even admitted you were wrong? And when's the last time you changed your mind? Because, uh, I mean, just given what he's been, I mean, he's right, what he's just talking about there a moment ago. You got cats who ain't never been wrong about nothing or ain't been wrong in a long time, and they've never kind of changed their mind. I'm not talking here about sort of cardinal doctrine kinds of things, but, but just kind of said, no, I, actually I've been persuaded differently, and, and I, I'm now moving in a different direction. They're likely going to be difficult people at some point in the course of the, of the church and, and the leadership of the church. And so those would be two questions I would ask folks who are prospective leaders. This one's I'm thankful for both of you brothers' example. You've shaped me. I, I respond to a lot of people and thought, can I hear the BD saying this? Um, and I've done a lot of things <laughs> uh, just based on imitating what I've experienced from you. And I love that you both give uh, a clear and biblical but different expression of what that looks like that's helpful for uh, younger men. Um, before we go to our next section, it is 9.05. So if anybody would like to go home and get some sleep, now would be the time that you can do that. If you could quietly dismiss yourself again, there's books in the back, in the bag. Uh, for anybody that wants to stay and ask Mark and Thabiti a question, we will have about 45 minutes for you to do that. And we won't Max. judge you if you need to go. Emphasis on quietly. What you I was just saying we won't judge you if you must go. Yeah, we won't judge you if you must go. Just please go very quietly. While, if you're here and you would like to ask them a question, please take this time to write your question down uh, if you think it's going to be helpful for everybody to hear. While you're thinking about your question, I have one last question for you both. Just so you don't forget it. Yeah, just so you don't forget it, that's all. Um, I just want to talk about time management really quickly. Uh, did you guys waste time in your younger years of ministry? Because you don't want to say no. No. There that is. 
Yes. Okay. In what ways did you waste time? I'm just hedging my bets. He said, uh, no, I said, I said yes. Uh, what ways did I waste time? Well, sometimes I was wasting time because I didn't have a plan for my time, right? Uh, and so it was pretty early on. I forget, somebody said this earlier, but it was pretty early on that I learned it actually. Uh, so, so if Mark's most important tools are the Bible and his membership directory, the third that I would add is my calendar. Um, and so I, I regularly talk with young guys who come into the ministry and they are just in love with the notion of flexibility. I, I'm going to be flexible and get to sort of do all this stuff and, and it's kind of organic. And, I, and, and invariably, three, six months in, they come back and they feel so unfaithful. They don't feel like they're doing their jobs or being fruitful, and they're not because they, they're actually not using their time well. They're not scheduling and planning and putting the important things in uh, and, and, and not asking the Lord to teach them the number of their days, right? Um, and so I, earlier on, I wasted time because I didn't have a, a, a plan. Uh, I, didn't, I, I wasn't sort of planning for for my time. That would be one thing. And then and the other thing is related to something I said before. Sometimes I was quote unquote wasting time because I was giving myself trying to make something happen that I really should have just been trusting to the Lord and, and, and just going somewhere else and caring for somebody. Yeah, if I, if I wasted time early in my ministry, it was doing work at church as opposed to being at some of my daughter's horse events. That was wasting time. Tease it out. Well, Annie, our daughter, loved horses from the time she was like that tall. And we lived in England at first, and the horses were not far away. When we moved to Washington, D.C., the horses were further away. And while I would often take her, I mean, sometimes take her out to her lessons, long events that would go on on Saturdays would just, they would just take a lot of time. And I'm not saying I should have been at all those, but I should have been at more of those than I was at, I think. Yeah. Anyways, that you see younger ministers wasting time? Well, I will say among ministers as old as me, so I don't mean young folks like Thabiti, but I mean, you know, guys in their 50s and 60s. When we get together, the thing we say badly about the younger generation is they don't know how to work. Um, and that's very commonly said, and I hear that said by Christians and non-Christians uh, about the younger generation. And I think what's meant by that sometimes is the requirements of things that somebody says they have to have in order to work well just seems a lot higher than it would have been 30 years ago. And I think um, sometimes people comment positively, let's say, on, on our staff at church and uh, how well they work together. Well, part of that is because we have what you call office hours. People are in the office from 8.30 to 5.30 every day not 8.45 to 5.10, you know, 8.30 to 5.30. Now they have lunch, um, and, but they're not at Starbucks. They're in the office. They're there at the same time as each other. They actually work together. They get to know each other. Things can get done because they're all there at the same time. Now that's, that's not in the Bible. You don't have to do that, but that's, that's typical of a kind of group of people inconveniencing themselves to make possible access to others uh, in a way that I think has beneficial results to it. And in a way that I had some friends in Australia, I remember they were just moaning about how they could not find younger pastors who want to just be regular in their office hours and, and do sort of normally sacrificial stuff in the way that when they were young man, they would certainly have done it. All right, brothers, we're turning to the Q&A time. If you have a question, oh, who's doing mics? You have a question? No, oh, go. This is on, there it is. Mark, you kind of started to go there just a you moment gotta, ago. You got to give your name. Nathan Knight, Restoration Church, Washington, D.C. Best, worst, or best or worst practices towards wife and children as a pastor? Well, best is just making sure the church knows that your wife is your priority. And since they can get another pastor, she can't get another husband, uh, that your kids are your priority that that should not basically conflict with your ministry. It actually is coherent with your ministry. Of course, in specific weeks, there are going to be certain times when, yes, you're going to have to go to that elders meeting. It means you're not there when your wife, of course, that's going to happen. But the, your kind of basic life trajectory, you understand the unique role that you have with your family 
you don't have with any particular local church. You're replaceable with that church. Um, so I, I would just push that and make sure everybody's on the same page with that and, and what that might look like in your life. And then secondly, I want to make sure that your wife and your kids know that. So um, a couple, a few years ago with senior staff time, I, ha I asked the guys who are elders who are on staff at our church to ask their wives each to write two paragraphs that they knew would be read in this meeting. Paragraph one, does the church give your husband enough time off? Paragraph number two, does your husband take enough time off? Um, <clears throat> so they wrote those paragraphs, then the guys all brought them in, and we spent the next two or three meetings, so over several weeks, just reading a paragraph and then everybody going around asking questions or comments about it. And then reading another paragraph, and everybody going around asking questions, comments about it. So what, we, what I was trying to do is communicate clearly to the wives their importance and significance, and to the guys that, yeah, we're watching you. You know, are, are you taking the vacation time we give you? Would you? Does your wife think maybe you should be? Are there, is there anything you need to learn there? They just practices like that. If you have a question, uh, go ahead and raise your hand, and a brother with a mic will get to you. Hi, my name is Michael. I'm with New Union Baptist Church in Dayton, Tennessee. Uh, my question was, how do we implement discipleship in our local church uh, with older generations whose perspective on that ministry is, or on ministry is not as relational uh, as our younger generations is more of a relational concept with that ministry? Can you just give your first sentence again? How do we something? How do we implement? Implement what? Dis uh, discipleship. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know that I, I don't know that I agree with the premise of the question. That older people are less relational than younger people. Um, in fact, I think I can think of a lot of older people who are uh, more acutely lonely, uh, desiring of relationship. Uh, but but that aside, I, I think. Um, let me tell you, so in, in the first church where I had the privilege of being a senior pastor, um, we, my wife and I would invite people over for dinner. Uh, and we usually invite them over on a Sunday. And everybody was turning us down. And we just thought, okay, the ministry must be going badly. I don't, I don't know what's going on, but uh, nobody, nobody's accepted our invitation. And uh, before long, uh, one young brother felt very bad about having a decline. And he explained that there was something we were missing in the culture, that that that, that culture was still very family-centered on Sundays, very much going to Big Mama's house and having family dinner. And so that's where everybody was and why nobody was coming. I said, oh, well, great, we'll start doing Tuesdays and Thursdays. And one of the first couples we had over was an older couple in the church. They'd been in church 30 years. She'd been teaching Sunday school 25 of those years. He had come to faith later in life. And uh, we're sitting there having dinner, and, and you know, she's cutting the chicken and, and eating, and we're doing pleasantries, and, and about five minutes into the dinner, she just takes her knife and fork, lays them down flat, presses them down next to the plate, and she says, I can't take this anymore. And I just, I looked at my wife, my wife looked at me, I thought, oh, the chicken must be bad, <laughs> you know? And I, and I said, what do you mean? She says, I, I need to know why we're here. I said, what do you mean? She says, I've been at this church 25 years, and I have never been in a pastor's home. Are we in trouble? If so, tell me now. And so she thought it was a kind of principal's office kind of thing. We said, oh, no, no, no. We just want to get to know you guys. Want to know how you come to know the Lord, how you, what your walk with the Lord is like, and just fellowship with you. We think of you as kind of parents to us in the church. We've only been here a couple of months, but you loved us so well and just want to get to know you. And from that point, the conversation was just wonderful. And, and what it highlighted for me was... Um, and it was true of more people than just this couple, a lot more people, was that actually the older persons were, were not approached. They, not, they weren't invited. They weren't engaged. Um, and yet they were moving more slowly than some of the younger people, and they didn't know who was kind of faddish or hot and all that good stuff. They, they'd outlived being cool and, um, and all of that. And so it was a different kind of conversation. It was a different speed. But sort of mechanically, for me, it was the exact same thing. Open your home, open your heart, open the Bible, open your mouth and teach, you know, and conversate. And 
I did more listening with older people, much more listening with older people than I did with 20-somethings. Um, but invariably, it was, it was sort of the same elements of, of hospitality and kindness and uh, doing that slowly with them. Michael, right? Yeah, I think, I think I may know what you're talking about. The, the people in our church who were saved, uh, genuinely saved, were on the whole not used to having direct spiritual conversations with other individuals. That was odd to them. Whereas the 23-year-old who'd been in Navigators or InterVarsity or Crusade, you know, or FCA, they were used to contact evangelism and or one-on-one -on -one Bible study together. So I definitely had, when I came to CHBC in 93, 94, I definitely had a bunch of old people who I think were saved, but had, and they were certainly generally sociable, but they were not used to kind of direct spiritual conversation. Whereas the younger people, when they started coming in, they were more accustomed to that. And I think that's just a, a slow change where those younger people are going to get older and you just keep using them. The older people, the oldest ones will die. And then uh, and it won't matter then. And the, the, the other ones as they age, some of them will learn. Some of them won't learn. But the other people will build relationships around them, whatever they're like. And that will have its own utility. So, yeah, it just kind of melds together. I, I think that's right. And, and one of the things we've, we've tried to do in the last couple of churches that I've been in on this sort of question of discipleship and a culture of discipleship is we've kind of cherry-picked the older persons who do seem to be coming along with a vision for investing in other people. They seem to be coming along a little bit more quickly. Uh, and we've just formed kind of small groups of older persons meeting with the elders. And we've done this particularly with older women where all the elders of the church are meeting with the older women of the church with that Titus II ministry in mind. Uh, and what we found is we got wonderfully godly saints who, who have not had that sort of culture of you know, personal you know, um, engagement with others um, who can do it but lack confidence. And so our, our main ministry is just encouraging them, giving them, we're reading good books with them and, and talking through those books pairing them up and making suggestions about relationships. Uh, and that's, that's sort of growing the, the network of relationships between younger women and older women in the congregation. Hey, Will Harris, uh, First Baptist Lake, Waccamaw, North Carolina. Uh, earlier, y'all spoke about after uh, Brian and Jerry's sermons on the moral failure of a pastor and the effects that that sin has and avoiding it at all costs, but... Dr. Dever, you mentioned the pastor who preceded you uh, left because of a moral failure. I'm following a pastor who left because of adultery. Can't imagine I'm the only one who's called to shepherd in this room and lead people through that hurt, or who will be one day. And my question is, what special wisdom or advice would y'all have of having observed churches in that situation and yourselves led them through them to uh, lead people through that kind of hurt and, and healing? Yeah, it's very difficult. I mean, you're, 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 you're being called to care for some people who've been badly abused. And you, you kind of have to just begin realizing, don't take their reactions personally. Um, you just can't do that. So there were some things that my wife and I asked for that they just said no to, which I think now they would certainly say yes had we asked such things. But um, you, you just have to realize what a big event it is for them. And it was evident to me because when I first got there, one of the first things I did was this kind of visitation Brian talked about. I just went through all the people's homes, the guys who, the people who'd been there. I started from the ones who joined most recently and then worked backwards. Um, and so I got back to people who joined in the 70s and people who joined in the 60s and people who joined in the 50s, people who joined in the 40s and people who joined in the 30s and people who joined in the 20s. You know, and uh, pretty much all of them. Because I, I would get them to rehearse when they first came to the church, what it was like and what it had been like under every pastor since then. And the last eruption was uh, really big. And it was, I just listened to them. So I probably listened to 100 different older saints talk to me about their experience of the previous pastor morally blowing up. And I think one of the most important things it did for me was uh, give me a more accurate assessment of the spiritual maturity 
of so many of those people who honestly, I think, had a fairly carnal view of what had happened and what they should do in response, or at least immature. And it was useful for me to hear that. It, it quickly, I could tell who had a kind of spiritual depth and wisdom and who was simply a very nice person, maybe my brother or sister in the Lord, but they were not wise in the scriptures. They were not wise spiritually. Um, so there were a lot of benefits that came out of just a lot of patient listening about the spiritual trauma they'd been through. So was your question um, about sort of caring for them in the aftermath of that or sort of getting on as the new pastor? I, I think listening, your ears are a great way to establish trust. Hey, I, amen. Couldn't, couldn't, couldn't amen that enough. Uh, next. Oh, back there. Yep. My name is Scott. I'm uh, from Mercy Hill Church in Shepherdsville, Kentucky. Uh, this question has more to do with the sessions from earlier this afternoon, but I wanted to hear your input on it. Um, how would you offer personal pastoral care for a person who is not a member of your church, but attends regularly? Do you treat that situation differently from a person who has agreed with your church statement of faith and has signed the church covenant? Uh, yes, I, I do treat that differently. Um, be, because they're not members and because they haven't signed the covenant, they haven't agreed to um, some aspects of, of our shepherding care, there are limits to what I can do. So, for example, if it's a situation that's going to warrant discipline, um, I, we obviously can't practice that with someone who never intended to be a member of the church. Um, that That's just going to be all kinds of intrusive and... Um, yeah, so that there are limits. So yes, there are some differences. Uh, another difference is depending on the nature of the, the counseling care that's needed, um, I may have less time that I can give to that in comparison to people who have actually joined the church. And I understand they obligate my time and energy and, and counsel in, in, a, in a more significant way than just persons who happen to be coming along. And I, I know that can sound harsh to people, um, but I think I'm, I'm sort of abiding by a priority that the scripture actually establishes for me, right? I'm going to give an account for their souls in a way that I'm not for persons who just kind of, you know, come for a little while. Having said that, because I am concerned about that person's soul, uh, within the limits that I have, I, I would try to give some attention to and, and care. That, that might look like one session uh, and then a referral if there's much more that's needed. Uh, might look like a couple of lunches or something, but it wouldn't be sort of long-term intensive uh, kind of care because of the other priorities that, that are established in it. Yeah, there would just be a lot of variables in the way I would answer that. It would be, is the person a friend of mine? Yeah, so maybe a specific scenario might help. Uh, a woman that's been coming to your church that you know is about to, that professes to be a believer, but is about to marry an unbeliever. Would you offer counsel in that situation? Do you mean would I tell her don't do that or would I offer premarital counseling? Would you tell her not to do that? Of course I would tell her not to do that. Big time. Yeah. Yeah. If I knew about the situation. But the thing is, if she's not a member, I would think most likely I just wouldn't even know about the situation. Can, him, and then can we get a, this brother Mike right here in a green shirt? Jude, West London Alliance, London, Ontario, Canada. Uh, I got called to a church uh, that currently has two services. Um, I have begun working towards remedying that. I'd like to get down to one service. We have a third service that is in Arabic. Uh, we had Arabic Christians who went to the church and they began a service. And uh, I'd like to just know your opinion on, on, on what the long-term goal for that church should be. Um, they evangelize. Muslims. So we pray for fruit, but we're prepared for you know long haul. What should what should our goal be for that for that service and that group? Is uh, uh, like to hear what you think about that. Do you have the same set of elders? Uh, th they're under our elders. Uh, they have two leaders who would function very much like elders uh, and submit themselves to us. 
I think you want that Arabic group to, as much as it can, become its own church. Though you can have a very sisterly, you know, relationship between the congregations. Um, but I think you want them to take responsibility for their own spiritual lives as much as they can. Why, why is that? Why their own church and not just a service as part of the church? Because the, if, they, if it's an Arabic language, that's what you mean. It's not just ethnicity, it's the language. Yeah, they're just, you can't have the relationships between the people generally, even between the elders of your church and the members of that church. It, it just, it's, it's a kind of artificial arrangement that I think as much as possible you want to make it real by making it the elders the most mature they have. I don't know, like what Titus was doing, I think, in Crete and Titus 1. That, that would have been my answer to the question. I think there's some things that would be for the health of that congregation that might be hindered or stymied in the sort of informal arrangement that you're talking about that actually be sped up and deepened if they were their own congregation, the sort of calling and training of men for the pastor at the eldership, so on and so forth. I, I think there will be an enriching, actually, in that body uh, as they move toward being their own church. Can those men, could those men be elders in your church right now? Well, that's encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. In light of the trickling effect, we're going to do three more. This brother right here. Mm -hmm. My name is Matt Campbell. I'm in Spring City, Tennessee. Um, I guess simple question: How do you lead a church that is going through financial struggles? Well, it, certainly the church that I got to was going through financial struggles. Their budget was in the red. They had meetings that went out to close. Uh, how, how bad are the financial struggles? A little too green to judge that, I think, in, in some ways. But, uh, I mean, I, I've come here with our, you know, our, our church checking account well below zero. Um, Do you have any uh, godly men in the church who are good with their finances? Yeah, I think so. Right. I think you want to get one or two or three of those to give you counsel. Okay. Yeah. You want to be very, very specific with them, make sure they're understanding everything, and then you want to get some counsel. Are there elders in the church? No. Are there deacons? Yes. Are the deacons godly? Yes. Okay. Well, then are any of those deacons good with finances? Yes. Well, I would probably... So there's some good pieces in, in place. Yeah, yeah. So I would probably go to those brothers, just open up whatever's concerning you, and then get their read on it. So about six months into my first pastorate, um, I had for two or three staff meetings had our accountant come into the staff meeting and give everybody their checks and say, this would be like a, this be like a, a Wednesday, and says, um, if you can, don't cash it till Monday. Yeah, oh, we're going to need that Sunday offering for everybody's check. And after the second time, I went to her office and said, hey, you must never say that again because she's just discouraging people. And uh, probably a few weeks, uh, uh, a week or two later, uh, I just bolted up in the middle of the night uh, out, of, out of my sleep. Now, you got to understand, sleeping is a spiritual gift for me. I, I, <laughs> I don't have problems with sleep. And, and all of a sudden, I was losing sleep over this sort of constant sort of Financial, we were 1.2 million in debt. Uh, we were maxing out an overdraft kind of situation. Um, and so I called, I emailed the elders the next morning. I said, hey, we, we got to get together and we got to talk about this. Um, and uh, we need to pray. And so we, we did two or three things. We prayed uh, and asked the Lord to provide. Uh, we laid the need before the congregation um, and uh, did, a little, did a little campaign to relieve the debt. Uh, and three, we, we cut what we had to cut, right? And so it's like, I, some levels like your family budget. You, 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 you have to spend less than you make. Um, and so we had to make some hard decisions along those lines. All right. Anthony Spallone, uh, Woodstock, Illinois. Question, uh, Mark, I'd love to know, and Thabiti, just how you have the discernment to choose young leaders, like who you know, to invest in. I've seen the spiritual discernment. I've seen you give advice to certain people. They didn't follow it and it led to destruction, but you kind of have that sixth sense. Uh, plus a bonus question, would love to know Trip and Brian's perspective on recent CHH developments for free. 
The Thank CHA you. stuff can be offline. Here. You can still want to eat up all the good pasta. Davidi just wrote an article on it last night. What's your first question, brother? <laughs> you, uh, uh, younger guys yeah. and who to invest in. Yes, discernment. yeah. You, you're perfect discernment, perfect. discernment on that. Just discernment. He just watch who has a track record, who seems to be gifted, who, you know, w when I've got a, a group of uh, brothers in who want to be interns, the ones who are super eager to answer the questions and who are always staring right at me um, are the ones I'm probably not interested in. And uh, the ones who are looking around trying to make sure everybody's included, you know, kind of being like a sheepdog with a herd of a flock of sheep, that's the one I'm probably interested in. Uh, the, the people who I think I see influencing others that others will follow, those are the ones I'm probably going to go for. It's not, it's not alchemy. It's not rocket science. It's, uh, to me, it seems pretty straightforward. Yeah, but that's a wonderful answer. And, and maybe not as... I mean, it's straightforward giving your years, but I, I think a person can, <laughs> I think a person can be taken in. I, I think a pastor can be taken in by that young guy who's who's sort of, you know, in, in your face all the time and, and, and talking ministry game and, and wanting to be in the ministry and mistaking that um, for more than what it is, right? Um, and so that, that's why I think the answer is really quite quite helpful there. Um, so I've had young guys who, who just, you know, at one season, they're dying to be in the ministry and dying to, to preach. And, and I would say, uh, we need volunteers in the children's ministry. They kind of don't come around anymore because serving children is, is, you know, maybe beneath them or their gifts are too big for that or that's not their calling. And I'm just like, well, we're more fundamentally called to love the sheep and to love the congregation, to serve the congregation. And let's start there. If the guys aren't willing to do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm suspicious of uh, what's driving. The, the other thing I, I would say is um, I've spent a lot of time earlier in ministry kind of chasing guys who said they wanted to be disciples and, and realizing at some point, oh, what you've actually done is just abdicate responsibility for your spiritual life. And so now I say to guys, the guys who come and say to me, you know, we got a church that's about 130 members, right? And, and so if guys come to me and say, hey, I'd love to spend time with you, want to grow in these ways, and so on and so forth. I said, okay, um, but it's going to be up to you to do all the scheduling and all the follow-up to make the, I'm willing, but you, you need to be at least willing enough to follow through on what you say you want to do. Uh, and so I'm just trying not to be, you know, sort of placed in the position of taking more ownership of their spiritual life than, than I should. So that's basically what I do. I take all the initiative up front. I'm the one who risks the relationship by trying to establish it. But then once the guy takes me up on it once, and most people never take me up on it, I'll say to 10 people after church on Sunday, hey, call me up sometime. Nine out of 10 will not do it. But the one guy will do it. That's great. I won't commit to him to meet regularly. You know, it's just whenever he can get a hold of me, whenever we can get together, I'll give him a book. When he's read the book, call me back again. And then he can make of that relationship as much as he wants. As much trouble as he'll take, that's awesome. So why do you not agree to meet regularly? How many, how many guys are you meeting regularly with? Just the number of guys Zero. who take lots of initiative? I, I wouldn't say that's regular. It's often. It's okay. frequent or infrequent. It's however often, you know, Charles contacts me. It's yeah. however often, you know, Brian and I can arrange to get together. And is that, do you think, a principle that, all lead pastors should have? Is that a principle that's been later in life? Um, how should oh, we think about that? That's a good question. When the church was smaller, I did, I did meet with Aaron Minikoff like every week. That was fixed. But pretty soon as the church started to grow, I realized that my schedule needed to be more flexible. And I could meet the need by saying, listen, when we have a meeting, let's go away. You can always phone me again in a day or two. We'll try to come up with another time. But that way, every meeting could flex around whatever his schedule was like and my schedule was like. It just worked better. Who shall be the, uh, okay. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for meeting with us. Um, really appreciate that, the extra time. Um, so I pastor in Ferguson, Missouri, and it's a white church. Um, and Ferguson is but two thirds black. Um, there are two black members in my church. One of them is my wife, and the other one is another black member that's been there for a long time. And um, 
I'm running into a lot of walls um, with with that. And so my one, I want to check myself that I'm not falling into a pitfall of, of social justice gospel, uh, the false social justice gospel. Um, and I also want to have an, 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 I guess, an answer. Um, I have ideas in my head, but this is something I'm passionate enough about that I could see myself falling into that, not knowing it. Um, so I, I want to have an answer for people who, I, I guess, accuse me of that, that that's not what I'm doing, that I'm looking at the social justice issues through the lens of the gospel. Um, and then also a big part of the problem is my eldership. There are two elders and they're cool guys, but they are so non-confrontational. And this has exposed that uh, they don't, I, I don't think they take really not just this sin, but other sin seriously. And I don't know how to, I don't know what to do with that. So. I, I lost just one bit in your question. You, you what, what wall you were running into or, or what you were running to a wall on? So there's a lot of uh, traditions, stumbling blocks is what I've tried to address them from the pulpit and conversations. We are placing, we are placing stumbling blocks before our, our, our black community to the, to the road to the gospel. And I say we remove those. Well, those are very, sir, there's a lot of those. Could, are, could you give an example? Um, white. Wait, wait, hold on. Is this being like broadcast or anything? Yeah, thank you. Still? Seriously, you're up this late watching this? I mean, you've got nothing else you could do? <laughs> Listen, this is like, this is a Q&A time to just kind of petering off here. We could just have the test tube come up and just go off air for this last question. You know? Thank you so much. Hope you're with us again tomorrow. There's that loving sharpness we talked about earlier. <laughs> Are we done? We're good. Brother, go right ahead.